Welcome to the Cerebral Edge with strength and conditioning specialist, Coach Chris. Join us for the next 30 minutes as Coach Chris shares ways to improve your health in all areas of your life. Along with his special guests, he strives to give you that cerebral edge to help make you 1% better every day. Now, here's Coach Chris. This is the Cerebral Edge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. Welcome to the show. We're back again with a panel of guests. We've got Nathan Craig, Wes Barnett, Morgan Flaherty. Flaherty, right? Yes. <laughs> I was like, did I say that wrong? I've, I've actually been corrected by many people, including the boxing coach at the Olympic Training Center, um, Coach Billy. He's from Ireland. He's like, oh, it's Flaherty. That's Flaherty. And so I don't know. I actually don't really know anymore what his name is. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Grove Higgins. And with me, as always, Coach Chris, right? And I have that weird last name, too, Gieski. I've got Geiski, right? All kinds mm-hmm. of different uh, ways that I guess I'm supposed to pronounce my name, too. So <laughs> I totally get it. So anyway, the first question we're going to kick off to you guys right now is what is the best peach of piece of coaching advice have you ever received or even given Nathan so mine's gonna be a little bit different um, this is more of a leadership thing so in 2017 I was in a small uh, small base um, in Iraq and I was actually one of only a few army guys and everybody else's Marines mm-hmm. and the the colonel that was in charge of that task force is hands down the best senior leader I've ever worked under and and I wouldn't even say it's a piece of advice, but it was how he built and structured the culture of hmm. that base because it was small, because it was just us. I mean, we're out there by ourselves. This is this is post you know global war on terror when you know Iraq had hundreds of thousands of people. Now it's just like there's a couple of us and like the the country. I mean, that's like we're on our own. You know, we had some of our outer perimeter security was not exactly. Uh, not exactly, you know, safe. <laughs> if you could say it that way, it's kind of like Afghanistan Just was say the least. Taliban. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> so very similar. But for me, it, what I took away the most was how he structured the culture. You know, there was this whole whole structure of you know Camp Mannion X. You know, and we had these you know workouts or in a t shirt, and you had the um, every time somebody new came on the base, he would personally come down there, introduce himself, tell him a story. Oh, that's awesome! And, and talk to them individually, like a like a person. You know, mm. which you don't see with senior leaders very often. Not very often at all. When you get visitors, you know, you'd say, hey, let me know if you're going to have a visitor. And he would personally, like, walk them in the office and say, hey, here's our base. And then again, the whole, the whole rundown, regardless of what the rank was. Mm. So it was just that, that culture that he built was just what I took away from it. You know, there was a thing called Turley's Orphans, which was, I don't even know where the history came from, but that was just kind of like us because we're out there on our own. We're almost like orphans all by ourselves, but because we we're together, we were a family. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter what branch you were in. You could be Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. Didn't matter. Everybody worked together as a family. So nice. that's kind of what I took away was that culture that he built. That's great. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, when I, uh, from my perspective, you know, the, the rapport is probably the most important thing that a coach can build between himself and his athlete or his team and mm-hmm. uh, things like that. If you don't have that, you can have the best advice in the world and whatnot, and you just won't get the engagement that you will. And especially... The, the, this throws the whole gender thing in there. Working with uh, female teams, you know, as a male, um, you can get a lot of friction built up by not respecting that aspect and building those relationships. Mm-hmm. And then uh, you can get them working against you. Whereas, you know, a bunch of guys, I can go, you know, and kick them in the rear and, and call them call them names and insult them, and they'll work harder for me. Yeah, uh, you got to know your audience, and you got to know who you're working with, uh, and such like that. And rapport is is where it's all at. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wes, cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, in, in weightlifting in in the era that I lifted, um, it was pretty much uh, the upper weight classes where I was at was dominated by the Russians. Um, then of course, you know, maybe the worst thing that happened um, was when the Soviet Union broke up and uh, now instead of one Soviet Union <laughs> team, you had, you know, 15, uh, you know, different Russian republics. Mm-hmm. And at, a t- at the time, it was more difficult to make the Soviet 
team than it was to actually win the Olympic gold medal. So wow. in some of those classes, so if you made the team, you know, it was, you're almost a, a, a shoe in because they were, they were that good. Wow. Um, so there was always this uh, kind of expectations, you know, the United States, we were, you know, the powerhouse in the fifties and the, in the sixties. But then after that, um, we were just kind of uh, not, and there's a lot of reasons uh, for that. But um, so everyone had this kind of expectation where, you know, you're going to finish or who's going to win or how you're going to do. And the one thing that Dragomir said to me that, um, you know, that has stuck with me, you know, not only through my lifting career, but also I use this in my, in my everyday life, uh, his bit of advice was, hold yourself to a higher standard than anyone else expects of you. Mm -hmm. And when you think of that, you know, in, in, in no matter what scenario you are, you're in <laughs> life, work, you know, marriage, family, sport, whatever, I think if you can subscribe to that and, and, and live by that, uh, you're going to be far better off than, than not. So mm -hmm. I always tried to do that every competition I went into, Hey, you know, let me show the world who I am. You know, I, I'm not going to be relegated to, you know, down here, you know, at the bottom. So um, I would work and train um, along that philosophy to, to kind of get to the point where um, I was contending with, with the, the, the big the boys, let's call them, the, the, the top of the heap there. And, uh, you know, eventually that worked out well for me and, uh, you know, where I won our, our first world championship medals for a, for a male weightlifting athlete in like three decades. Uh, but again, it's something that I take with me and, and, and have used in my whole life after that. So yeah. hold yourself to a higher standard than anyone else expects of you. It's three decades? Three decades we hadn't won a medal at a world championship. Wow. And um, I did it in 1997. That's, <laughs> that's pretty amazing. So that kind of goes back to that uh, saying, how you do one thing is how you do everything. That's right. Right? So holding yourself to that higher standard, it doesn't matter what it is you're doing, right? Um, doing chores or whatever, right? Making sure it's done to the best of your ability. Going to the gym, right? Make sure you follow that program to a T. Every set, every rep, whether you want to or not. That's <laughs> you're exactly right, and and now trying to instill that in my kids, uh, you know, you just talked about chores and house cleaning mm -hmm. and keeping your room clean. Yeah, it's still a struggle, but I'm trying to instill that in the kids as well. <laughs> feel like you'll be a, a an all American one day. One day, <laughs> if just you... make your bed every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> Morgan, um, I'm gonna try not to take too long um, because. There's been an unbelievable number of people that have supported me um, along my path of trying to make an Olympic team and try to break the national team and earn a medal. Um, and like everybody has given me such great, great advice um, along the way that I've really kept to heart. So I guess I, guess I have a couple little nuggets yeah. um, that I can share. And then I'll give like the granddaddy of them all at the very end. I love it, the granddaddy. Um, <laughs> the first, uh, the first one, uh, it's got to be my high school wrestling coach. Um, he didn't like tell this to me, but he taught it to me, mm -hmm. and that was find your breaking point. Um, so after uh, I got pretty good my sophomore year in high school, to the point where I wasn't getting challenged too much in the wrestling room. So he took it upon himself to um, wrestle with me after practice until I quit. And so I would just try my absolute hardest until I could get a takedown on him. Mm -hmm. And it took me about three months of wrestling for about an hour to an hour and a half after wrestling practice um, to finally get a takedown. And like there were more days of crying than there were days of oh, yeah. happiness. And it'd be funny because, uh, you know, I would beat everybody up in practice and then he would show me what's up and then like you know once once I took him down it started everything started shifting so then he started sending me to other places to find new partners because he's like you've moved on you know young Padawan and that um, reminds me of the scene of Good Iron Gang where he's like where the rock dresses up in the pads he says <laughs> knock me on my butt <laughs> yeah. yeah it was uh, that for me was like an important lesson um, was to find your breaking point and um you know, because I try, I would go as hard as I could until I could not do anymore, and like my body just 
gave up on me yeah. all those times. And uh, so the next like quintessential shift that happened for me was um, when I got invited to move to Colorado Springs to train with the national team here. Um, I was playing rugby at UC Davis. I was wrestling at the university, but they had their team cut. So I only had two years of division one wrestling, only one year of partial varsity. I was like wrestling off constantly for the spot. And the other guy was up getting the best of me most of the time, hmm. um, all of the time. <laughs> and, um, and so, uh, when I finally got invited to the Colorado Springs, it was because I was writing letters to places to go to try to keep wrestling. Cause I wanted to finish my career. And, um, one of the coaches here called me and he says, he says, Hey, uh, his name was Momir Petkovic. And uh, he says, Hey, I hear you want to wrestle here in Colorado Springs with the uh, Olympic team. You know, um, what makes, uh, uh, what, why do you want to come out here? I was like, I've, I've resolved to make an Olympic team and earn a medal. Um, and that's what I've been wanting to do my whole life. Um, and he's like, Okay, and at this point, I had never all American. Didn't even place a state in high school, or um, mm -hmm. we we did win uh, nationals in rugby, but that's rugby. It's not Greco-Roman Olympic wrestling. Right. And um, he said after I said like you know I want to earn this and now that and I earn that, and he's like that doesn't matter. I was like, what do you mean? He says it doesn't matter how many medals you have around your neck. It matters how you breathe and how you walk which ultimately will determine whether or not you can become a champion. Yeah. And I will know when you walk through these doors whether or not you have what it takes to become a wow. champion. Wow. And I'm like floored. And I'm sitting there like, okay, um, <laughs> what, what, what do I do now? And he's like, well, if you can come out here and wrestle with us, uh, there's an opportunity for you to live with somebody for a month and um, you can try out. And if you uh -huh. like it, or we like you, you can stay. And so um, Coach Muhammad uh, took me in. I uh, lived at his place for a month. My professors at school were all cool with it. Mm. Um, so I lived in Colorado Springs for a month. And then I got, um, I became a mop on the mat. And uh, <laughs> Momir liked what he saw. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think I scored a single point. But like he liked what he saw, and then he invited me to come back. So when I graduated, um, college I moved to Colorado Springs and that was how that began yeah and off of his like little quote that gave me hope and belief in myself that you know it doesn't matter how good I have been mm -hmm. because I was like I don't think I belong here as much as I wanted I don't think I belong at the Olympic Training Center and he's like no no no, that's not what matters and so that gave me hope in yeah. that in fulfilling that journey I, um, think, uh, I think a huge piece too was having your coach come in, right, and telling you to take him down, and you getting wiped all those times. <laughs> so then you're going Good into point. the OTC, right? You're probably like, yeah, this is all hat, right? Yeah. I can know I can handle at least three months yeah. in a row um, before I get a takedown, uh, which is kind of what happened in college too. Um, but but the most important piece of coach uh, coaching advice I gotta say came from my dad. And it wasn't even coaching. He kind of said it offshoot. Mm -hmm. um, and he would say it all, these like random little quotes all the time. He just lived by these maxims. He just wanted to be as concise as possible. Is and this the, the granddaddy one? Yes. Awesome. And my dad said, relax into what must be endured. Ah. And that has like always come in handy. Like mm -hmm. just no matter how bad things can be, you never know how bad things can be. But mm -hmm. if you can relax into it and find peace in those moments, then you'll be fine no matter what happens. Yeah, that's that's one thing I always said, especially when things got really rough, either in training or through um, combat or through uh, basic training, is the one thing that I always say in my mind is this isn't going to last forever. Hmm. That's that's one thing that I always kept up here, right? So whether the you know instructor was like, hey, you got to do 50 more push-ups, I'm just like, it won't last forever, right? Mm -hmm. And I just kind of pushed through that. But the other thing that I really like, the parallel between you two, is that you guys didn't just go through and, and come out as just <clears throat> studs from the get-go, right? It, it took a while to build that up, which I found fascinating, the parallels between that, which is awesome. I'm still working at it. <laughs> well, you, 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 have to, you have to lose in order to learn how to win. And mm -hmm. uh, similar stories. I mean, older brother, you know, 
beat me and everything all the time. My weightlifting coach, um, you know, he was a great basketball player and I played high school basketball and it was the same sort of thing with your coach. And 15-0, 15-0, 15-0, 15-1, 15-1, then 15-4. Then when I could beat him, uh, I'd go to high school and those kids didn't stand a chance. So you're exactly right. You've got to you've got to take the lick. Mm-hmm. A lot of people aren't willing to to take the licks. Um, mm-hmm. You know, they want that instant gratification, the instant success, and you've got to you've got to take your lumps. And and just there are so many that aren't willing to do it and stick it out. But uh, that makes the winning part that much sweeter. Right. Mm-hmm. Awesome information today, guys, on the Cerebral Edge and Power Talk 1040 KPPF. Got to take a quick commercial break, and we'll be right back. We are back with Power Talk 1040 KPPF. This is the Cerebral Edge with Coach Chris, and I'm back with Wes Barnett, Nathan Craig, Morgan Flaherty, and Doc Grove Higgins. And this is my next question for this wonderful panel, is what other areas of your life improved or did you have to take away to be all in your sport? I guess I'll start. Um, All right. And I'll I'll start with some of the subtractions from from living a, um, I guess you could say a servant, servitude type of life, uh, whether that's military or when I was working hospital security or things like that, any kind of public safety, um, you definitely lose a lot of your free time. Uh, you do lose some health. You have definitely sleep disruptions and you have all these health things and you get exposed to chemicals and electromagnetic radiation and things like that. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of health uh, side effects that kind of come through, especially after decades of, of that. But on the positive side, you just get so much when it comes to um, your leadership skill and your ability to learn and, and expand and like see the world differently. You go different places, you see different people, you interact with different cultures. Um, and I think you just see that, that bigger picture um, towards the end and you can start putting pieces together from, you know, this piece over here connects to this piece over here and you kind of have this, this mm-hmm. big little mind map that kind of collects a lot of things together and now you start to process and think in different ways than, than probably um, other people that you're around. Mm-hmm. So that's some of uh, the big te- takeaways that I've taken. That's great. Well, some of the some of the losses, I think you um, perceive them as being losses um, while you're on this journey, and it's not until you get to the end that you look back and and realize that they weren't really losses at all. Right. Um, but a lot of it goes back to uh, you know, for me, high school. Um, you know, there was never a spring break that that I went to. There was. You know the the, the partying and, and and all that. You know it was just never part, and and you feel like you're missing out on things yeah. because where are you at? Well, you're in the weight room, you're in the gym, you are, um, you know, kind of doing things that um, that others aren't doing, and you know you're perceiving them as, as having all this fun, and, and and here you are kind of stuck stuck in the grind. Um, but it's not until you get to you know ultimately where you end up that you look back and you say. Boy, I, I really didn't miss anything at all because when you look at where you ended up, mm-hmm. you know, made a couple Olympic teams and I've worked for the Olympic Committee, traveled all around the world, and you get to meet and, and know, you know, so many great, amazing people and have all of these amazing experiences. And you look back at uh, kind of the same folks that you thought were, were having such a great time and they're just kind of stuck. Uh, and, and, and kind of still in that space, never having experienced that, working a, you know, a, a, a nine to five mm-hmm. blue collar job. And, uh, you, you know, so when you look at it, yeah, while you're in that moment, it feels like a loss. But um, at the end of the day, um, you you wouldn't trade it for the world. You're very mm-hmm. fortunate to to be where you where you are. Uh, and that's really what goes into, you know, making you who you the person that you are. Um, without those experiences, I would have never been the person that I am today, and, mm-hmm. and, and never be in the position uh, that I that I am. So yeah, you, you find out a lot about yourself when you take yourself to that edge, to that limit, right? And that's where a lot of growth comes from. And like you said earlier, not a lot of people are willing to do that. Um, and we had a conversation before we start we started was 
you're like, man, I was in, Mil- or in um, Missouri, and you're like, it was Saturday, people were sleeping, and I had to get up and go to the gym. 6 a.m., cold, dark, by yourself, and you just sit there, you know, your body's aching, and you're like, what am I doing? Uh-huh. Uh, but then when you're standing um, up on the medal dais at the World Championships, okay, I guess this All is right. what I was doing it for. <laughs> so it all pays off. I love it. Morgan. Shoot. Um, I'm going to try. I I want to kind of approach this backwards. Go ahead. Um, and that is like, I still feel like I have the opportunity to miss out. And yeah. that's because, you know, I'm still in the grind. You're of, in it. I'm still in it. Yeah. And I feel like every day I have the opportunity to miss something and to lose something. So it's like every day is an opportunity, which isn't this is probably like my weakness in the, my mentality the the chink in my armor that's great that, people need to hear that yeah it's right. it's i mean my weakness is that every day matters so much that mm-hmm. uh that i'm almost i'm almost longing for the results before they happen right whether it's not making the team like how am i going to have resolve for not making the olympic team after putting my whole life to it and and so I feel like that is like I still have that to lose. Mm-hmm. And so um, that is one of the things that I feel at this stage of the life at, of my career where I like want to make, uh, you know, the next Olympic team and then the one after that, because in L.A., I mean, I'll be 36, which is when people people I'm 32 already. People are saying like, oh, how long are you going to wrestle for? And I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm going to wrestle until you have to drag me off the mat. Until the wheels fall off. Until the wheels fall off until I ha- or until I have my resolve. And you know, as long as I'm ready, willing, and able and healthy, I'm going to keep after it. Mm-hmm. And I think there's, like, standing at the podium at L.A., you know, hometown California, all friends, family, all the people that have been there from the beginning have the opportunity to see that. I feel like I have that to lose. And so, um, and I have the opportunity to bring that to all these people and not only that, but like fulfill some of the things that I really believe in about the way the world works and the way the universe works. And like, it's kind of like, like I said, bringing me that resolve, um, mm-hmm. as opposed to like, what did I miss out on life? I mean, I get asked to coach places and I have to decline cause I'm like, I really need to finish this chapter of my life. Mm-hmm. And, um, for, and on the flip side, like I mentioned, I feel like all of the sacrifices that I'm making in order to do this for my sport, mm-hmm. um, I, to me, it's a sense of pride. Like I, I like that I am willing to let go of all these things so that way I can focus on something. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just fulfilling and I, I want to find more truth um, in myself, but also in, in the world that we live in through this endeavor of like pushing as far as I can in, mm-hmm. in sport. But, yeah. but also there, you know, being an athlete, an elite athlete, there is a bit of selfishness that, that, that comes with that because your yes. your life as an athlete, the window that you have is, is so short. Yeah. And the one thing that you never, ever want is the, the what ifs. Yes. So if you don't put all your chips in and, and go for it, um, you'll be asking yourself, yeah, exactly. what if, what if, mm-hmm. and, and that is the, the worst feeling in the world. So... If you can do it, great. Mm-hmm. Um, a, a lot of people can't, um, yeah. but if you can, do it because at the end of this, you don't want any regrets. Mm. Yeah, but but I, but I love the way uh, Morgan also said. It. I still feel like I'm missing out some sometimes, right? Because that makes you human, yeah. right? And people will sit there and be like, "Oh, well, they're just an athlete. They just love to do it, so they do it, right?" It's nothing can be further from the truth sometimes. Well, what you have to think about, too, is those that are around you. Like, um, you know, my wife, um, you know, we had a small child. And the amount of time that I was home compared to away in the gym on the road, you, you kind of miss those years. So that's, a, that's another thing. And, mm-hmm. you know, you try to make up for it, you know, kind of later in life uh, the best that you can. But, again, if you want this you've got, there's this level of selfishness that you have to have that a lot of people don't understand. They don't understand Um, at all, yeah. But you want to leave this when when it's time to hang them up to look back and say, I gave it my all and Mm -hmm. and I don't regret anything. Yep, and there's a piece in that, right? 
Then yeah. Absolutely. Right. I think people don't realize that there's such a, a strong connection between high-level athletes, high-level performers, whether it's public safety, you look at like astronauts, like we all have a very similar mentality and a very similar mindset. And mm-hmm. all just kind of connects. Like you can, you can see we have almost similar stories with a completely different life track. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. Um, that's that's one thing that you know we hear in the army all the time, right? Is is you don't rise to level situation, you fall level of your training. Yeah. Right. So I think that's that's awesome. I'm so glad I guys had you guys on. Um, it's been awesome. Uh, thank you for coming on. This has been the Cerebral Edge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. Join us every Saturday as we try to make you 1% better. Stay tuned next week here on the Street Bridge on Power Talk 1040 KPPF. This has been the Cerebral Edge on KPPF. Have a question for Coach Chris? Email him at CerebralEdge1 at gmail.com. That's CerebralEdge, the number one, at gmail.com. Join us next Saturday at 1 p.m. and Sunday at 10.30 a.m. for another episode of the Cerebral Edge with Coach Chris on Power Talk 1040 KPPF.